Okay, um, hello everyone and thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Curtis Watt. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm a local sort of writer and performer and uh, also I've been involved in community arts and um, social uh, projects around social issues for quite a long time now actually. Um, just quickly, one of the projects I've been working on is called Man Up. Uh, in um, Stockbridge Village and um, West Derby, Nottyash, uh, Mablane and around that area. And the whole point of that project is to uh, talk to young men about being young men and about being a man and things like that. Uh, and then talk about crime as a sort of um, sideline to that. Um, so just a little bit about that and if anybody's got any questions about that at any point, uh, we can include that. Uh, I just want to um, introduce the panel. Um, we've got Tasha Ryan, here at the end, from Reform, um, who educate people about crime and the consequences of crime. Um, mainly in London and Manchester, was it? Manchester? Manchester. Mainly in Manchester. They've just done a really good workshop as well. Uh, you can ask them any questions about the things they specialise in. Um, we did have um, Jamal uh, Al-Shabazz, but he had to leave. Unfortunately, he was called away to do his job. Uh, we've got Jazz Agency here, who's Executive Director of Bruhaha International. Um, and Alison Doherty, um, who is Community Safety and Community Cohesion Service Manager uh, for Liverpool City Council. Um, so, um, I wanted to just to get the ball rolling, really, by just asking the panel in general, and whoever thinks they've got a good answer or reply to this can get the ball rolling. Um, in your opinion, um, how can the local community come together to work on early intervention? So, as in, uh, I mean, you from Reform, you might know a lot about early intervention. Well, oh, sorry. Um, well, I think first of all that um, it should start from the schools and home. And I think the key issue, because at the moment we do the safeguarding in Greater Manchester for the schools with um, the crime and consequences. And I think one of the um, issues I've come across is that there's so many people doing crime and consequences, but there's no one speaking about the aftermath. And I think to get to the young people about the consequences, we need to enforce the aftermath because the aftermath is more worse than the beginning because people specialise on, you know, if you get into trouble, you go to prison, yet that is hard, but you've done a crime and that's the consequence of the punishment. The hardest bit is the release because when a person comes out of prison, the class is disadvantaged and it comes with a criminal record and some people want to come out and change their life and unfortunately, if they haven't got the willpower and the people supporting them and there isn't certain places put in place authority-wise, then they're going to fall and that's why the prisons are on red alert and people are going back because I think the problem is, is young people need to be educated from young about the aftermath of crime. Mm. rather than the prison, the aftermath of crime, because the, the prison's the punishment anyway. The yeah. aftermath of the crime is the rest of your life. And I think people forget that we've got a culture, because when people say the word culture, they never think about British culture. And people think about all the different cultures that make it up from different places, but there is a culture of the place that you grow up in, regardless of where it is. And to other people from outside that culture, it might look strange because it's, we do have extremes in culture. Well, I was having, I was discussing that before, sorry to interrupt about um, you know, going to prison because I'm actually an ex-offender as well. I'm Kemi's business partner and I was actually having a conversation about, you know, when you first go to prison and you know, the emotions that people feel and actually when you get released and there's a tendency to, you know, people, especially when you go and do an offence at a young age, you've got your young peers come to you, you know, what was it like? And, you know, you're trying to put a brave face on. But the truth of the matter is, it's scary. It's not a nice, it's not a nice place to be. And if you're a young person away from family for the first time or away from your peers for the first time in a strange environment, a quite aggressive and, you know, volatile environment, it's not nice. And I think one of the things what reform do is, we're quite open and honest as well about our experiences because we believe we want to help young people to understand the reality of what it's about. It's not the bravado of, oh yeah, it was all right, it was cool. Okay, there was good days. There was days that was better than others. 
but on a whole it was a mental battle you know it's that mental torture of you know can I get through this you know you had your calendar that were knocking the days down and it's not nice not everyone survives not everyone it. survives you see people that are crumbling before your <coughs> eyes and to watch that alone that has an effect on you you see people fighting yeah but it's more mental it's not physical and that mm-hmm. alone some people don't overcome and I think that is something that people need to be made aware of as well mm-hmm. I've got no confidence in the, in the system. Um, I've got no confidence in the courts either. Uh, one of my sons went uh, has been to prison at least eight times. Um, I don't want to know if he's been nine or ten. I'm sticking at eight, although I'm sure he's done anything from two weeks, two months, two years. He, he's done it all. And uh, he's 29. Um, and I, I believe that he's got uh, ADHD, dyspraxia and dyslexia, and that's just to name three. The system has failed him in terms of identifying anything th- that's wrong with him. He is an independent man now. I can't take him by the hand and take him to seek help. He's got to do it now. And he was kicked out of all kinds of schools yet he was the one who you looked at him and you could cry because there's some, there was something about him and still that you feel sorry for him and the school didn't understand so out of frustration he used to commit a crime and I used to say to him why did you do that? I don't know I said well l- look at the consequences I didn't think and he doesn't think and he just goes with the flow he goes, he goes along with the crime he goes along with the, the courts he goes along with the prison sentence and he goes along with everything he came out, I think, um, seven, eight months ago. And there's no guarantee that that was, that'll be the last time because he might just do something. Have you found any, or is, is there any visible support there? As in, have you seen any posters or flyers or heard anything on the radio or TV where the support for things like that, for example, if you feel like um, you might have some underlying issues going on, that that might be why you're getting into crime, where you can actually go to some kind of group sessions or anything like that. Is there anything like that out there? His confidence has been stripped away as well. So for him to go into a group, it, it, it's a huge step. Um, I'm glad to disclose that because I, I was wondering whether to speak about one of my nephews. But he was sort of like more or less kicked out of school when he was about 13 and sent to a specialised school. <coughs> Come away with no qualifications. Took him to several different places, council and whatever. And each time they were allowed in the room and it was a group practice, you would think there was nothing wrong with them. It's fine, great. But I think there is support out there, but the individual themselves there's got to be someone or some way of how to get through to them to encourage them to go along and be open but he won't be but do you not think that takes a social change this is like a question to everybody really yeah. sorry i think that um when i went to primary school which was in the 60s and you were dyslexic it, the word didn't exist you were yeah. either slow <coughs> thick or lazy and that and that was it so in 25, 30 years, we've, we've, we've come away so that, I mean, people are actually defining that these actual challenges that young people and children have exist mm-hmm. and acknowledge them and acknowledge that there is, there is um, strategies to deal with that. Um, I've, just been li- I've just been listening to everything that's been going on. One of the things I really think is, is that there is, um, now there are some real effective, I think engagement has to start at primary school. It, it actually starts that the, it used to start at the shore starts when we had them, mm. but they've gone, mm. mostly gone. Um, but primary school is the place where a range of these um, strategies and issues are being looked at, but could be better looked at. I mean, uh, ring bell, my wife's a primary school teacher after, after many years of doing something else. She always says to people that drop their kids off, you do realise that I'm with your kids more hours in a year than you are as a parent. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I really, it's, it's, it's and, and suddenly realising that, that, that these people that are instrumental in our children's lives, in, in dealing with issues, moving them forward educationally, I mean, I'd say about 50% of her work is not actually 
educational, it's social. It's having to look at all these issues of, 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 of dyslexia, of dyslexia, all those, all those different issues that young people and children have and trying to find strategies to actually deal with that in an educational and classroom setting. So I, I think that there lies the big challenge. How do we make those interventions in primary school in a system, in an environment that is, that is pressurising and, and um, what's the word, scapegoating teachers or parents or social workers or families constantly try and find me good press about it. Um, and so, on one hand, you've got this very, very stressful environment um, that, that sort of teachers and educators are trying to survive in. And on the other hand, they're having to deal with, with a whole range of social issues over many hours within the day. Um, but I still think there's a joined up, yeah. there's more joined up thinking to be had there. I've been working with um, homeless young men who have low expectations in life. And when I've been talking to some of these young men, one of the things that always comes out is, you know, they've been thrown out of their home, they're disaffected, they've come from a broken um, home society where they live. So their expectations in life is only to look at crime because that gives them a status symbol, it gives them an income and it gives them um, something to hold on to, something to belong to, like a gang. And um, I was, I've worked it for NACRO, I've worked with um, ex-offenders and everything else, but this current climate I'm seeing of young people seem to see crime as their only way out of the situation, their environment it, that they were brought up in and they don't see any further than that element. And I think one of the things that society has to deal with is not just dealing with the young person and the consequences, as that group of young ladies have just been saying, the consequences. When you're 18, you cannot see what your life will be at 30. You think what I do now may not have an effect at 30, but it does, and it follows them all the way, as you've said, through their lives and they cannot break that cycle. And they in turn have children who become part of a disadvantaged, disaffected family group, and they grow up with low expectations because of the family environment. So I think sometimes, just looking on the outside, I don't have the crystal ball, but you have to treat the whole family, not just the individual, because the family suffers the consequences and we've seen it being born in Liverpool, known very many people from gun crime. It's now the case of, it's not criminal against criminal, it's whatever a person has done, the whole family is targeted. Mm. And they become part of that crime. And, and, the, and the wider community may become part of that crime, which in itself perpetuates the whole scenario again. Because if you attack my family, I will attack your family. And that's the way it goes on. Well, one of the things, sorry, one of the things, you're absolutely correct. When we first started, because we're also, also qualified mentors, so we also do mentoring with young people. And when we first started doing mentoring, we were mentoring with the young people, but having limited interaction with the families and what was happening was we were trying to work positively <coughs> with the young people because the um, interaction with the family was limited everything we were trying to do weren't supported from the family so we weren't connecting through so what we do with our mentoring because it's a good point you've touched upon is when we mentor um, the young people we do actually get involved with the families because what we try and do is we try and work with the families positively because if they can see we're making positive changes with their young people they're going to encourage their young people to make them positive changes so therefore we're ultimately heading for the better results with the young people so it's a good point that you brought up and it's something that we've noticed and something that we've do working with young people young people and their families actually does work i think we have a difficulty with with, with social worth the fact that young people are not taught and told to aspire in certain mm. directions, yeah. Yeah. that other directions are much of more worth then or more value. Like mm. um, where are, you know, it's, it's even as, as growing up as soon as myself, we weren't taught 
how to make positive contributions to our neighbourhood, to our community, yeah. society. We just weren't, it wasn't part of, of, of our education. Um, so the mm -hmm. question is, where are those where are those skills being embedded? I mean, I know there are lots of organisations, you know, like yourselves that, that are doing this, but at a more kind of macro level rather than just in terms of grassroots or joined up thinking, it doesn't happen so much, particularly, you know, in the neighbourhoods that we are talking about and live in. It doesn't, those options... There's so much pressure on, on young yes. people as well. You know, you've got to have the latest sort of designer shoes. And, and when you start to kind of like map all that out... And I think that's that always been there. When I was growing up, the biggest thing you wanted was a Fred Perry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or, or Dunlop Green Flash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was it. Um, but, but that was always been there. But I think the volume oh, yeah. and the way it's which it's targeted yeah. and bombarded and continually... I mean, there was an interesting thing. The guy who was... Um, I was watching uh, news last night, late saying the guy who was the big brain thinker for Google, who's kind of a complete, complete kind of out there brain. techie brain, has now started to say that um, the whole idea of the social networking and da da da, da is now wrong. Mm. Mm. Really? And it is actually, it is actually losing more jobs than gaining them, and it's actually taking away people's power to be uh, um, to construct together as human beings rather than through these new you know mm. so we've always had that pressure I just think there's different stresses and limitations yeah, now that people undergo yeah. Mm. Um, sorry, yeah I think on the social networks very quickly I think you're right um, I think there is a problem on it and I think the, pro well, the problem will soon be rectified and I think that governments are going to make sure of that because of all these lawsuits and things that are going down, if you do this and say, I've never heard such a thing, you know, like you can say one thing to somebody on a street or wherever or in a but business in meeting, writing. and the next thing you go, you do something on Twitter, <laughs> and all of a sudden you're the worst <laughs> creature read. since Adolf Hitler. You know, it's like, don't read the bloody thing, it's simple. You can no, be bored. <laughs> but that aside, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is what oh. they've done is they have come up with, I'm going to say they, the us establishment, mm. we have come up with a new thing which you want everybody to be involved in and the only way to do it is to make them feel involved so they get involved mm. so we all go on these things and Facebooky stuff and which I don't do but still go on all these sorts of things and everyone's involved and go, right we've got you and everybody's buying the new things and they're, mm. they're changing four times a year you know and finding forget that the Fred personal Perry. information is being sold on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fred Perry A I couldn't afford it B if I had one I'd have had it for ten bloody years <laughs> you know <laughs> nowadays if you get a laptop thingy that Mm. That, yeah, right. yeah. if you get one of them the one, you the change way. it four <laughs> times a year and, and you have to learn all these other yeah. things the point that I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to be a dead old Miss Simpson person here the point I'm trying to make is as a 58 year old I can see the youngsters that I work with on the estates up in Nosley and I do work on the streets I don't work from a setting they have far more intelligence than I ever bloody had at 10 mm -hmm. and at 9 believe me they are way out there in the ether mm -hmm. and I think the thing that be cries at all is the way we patronise kids patronise these kids and not the questions we ask here but we do patronise them we talk to them anyway what is it you want to be when you grow up and they're looking at us going realistically and I'm sorry for the cameras oh do f what do you want to be when I grow up what choices have I got I know this at 10 and 11 because I can see you, 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 you. They can see all the people around them with no choices, with no bloody lives. They see them dying left, right and centre. So we can pretend all we want. We can be as positive as we want and we can lay little pats and go, oh, no, come to this youth club and do this. Oh, go away. We know what's going to happen and they know what's going to happen. The difference is that if we are going to offer choices, I would start teaching and doing things proper in prison and training people properly how to do stuff in prisons and that's how to train them in employment train them while you've got them there why are they going in 27 times I'll, I'll never know you know I'm, the I'm, absolutely I'm, the I'm a back twice and then I got battered yeah. basically so I never went again thank yeah. god but but the part um, and that was a proof school I'll own up it wasn't prison although I was in risk with Mary Bell hey <laughs> um, <laughs> now the point that I'm making is what we need are more people like you. We need more people who have, who are still at that age, 
Yeah, you'll be outdone in ten years' time. Believe me, five years' time. So <laughs> I'll just go somewhere else. But the point is, we need that turnover more and more of young people, of fifteen, twenty-year-olds, twenty-five-year-olds, probably up to thirty-year-olds. But the fact is, after that, go away and go teach twenty-year-olds and twenty-five-year-olds. Move on to something else. Don't stay in it for life. Too many of us, I. I work with um, adults now, it's not youth work, but too many of us try to stay within the one place thinking, yeah, I'm an expert at this, aren't I great? No, you're not. You was an expert, which is why you got to that position, and then it's time to move on. And it's time to move on, obviously, for somebody else to say so. The important thing, what you just said then, was about when you come out about no network support. And I actually do know of an organisation who have encouraged me to tell other people to tell a little lie so that they could get this support and help and it was when I used to be a future job fund supervisor, I had quite a few ex-offenders that were some of my, um, you know, underneath yeah. me. And they did absolutely brilliant, and they just thought this was fantastic. Unfortunately, it ended. But but have you thought about doing anything to um, go to local businesses or businesses well, and say, like, give ex-offenders a chance really so they're not yeah. going well, back and at back? The, at the moment, um, at the moment um, that's what we're trying to go into, oh, the good. government. Yeah. And um, to try and get organisations to give ex offenders um, second op- to give them a second chance because at sorry I know we've got to be quickly. The problem is there is opportunities there, but they're only for six and twelve months. Mm. These people need building, yeah. and for you to do this, you're breaking someone. You give someone an opportunity, and yeah. after twelve minutes, I mean twelve months, it's gone. You're destroying a person. Mm. You're not rebuilding them. So eventually, we want to be talking to the likes of you know people that do employ to see if they can give opportunities and not twelve. 12- 12 month schemes maybe after the 12 months to be fair to see if they can have a contract rather than them being dropped and the back at the job centre again yeah okay um and a positive note to end on i suppose is uh, that we came and everybody you know people turned up and yeah. were concerned about these issues um and i hope this isn't the end of you know this kind of yeah. forum and things like that because the more we communicate so to the panel and to the audience I, 